difference a little bit. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse uh, 1. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord sware unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldst keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Thy raiment wax not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these forty years. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of oil, olive, and honey, a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. Thou shalt not lack anything in it, a land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command thee this day. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full, and hast built goodly houses, and dwelt therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage, who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, and that he might prove thee to do thee good at thy latter end. And thou say in thine heart, My power, and the might of mine hand have gotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant which ye swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. So our message this morning is entitled, Thou Shalt Bless the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. And Lord, I pray that you would impress upon all of us what a merciful and gracious God you are and that our lives might be pleasing to you. And if there's anyone who does not know you, that today would be a day of salvation. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to notice two verses in our text. In verse 2, it says, And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and approve thee, to know what was in thy heart, whether thou wouldst keep his commandments or no. Uh, notice it says God led thee forty years. And God has led me the forty years that I've been the pastor of Calvary. He's had to humble me. And it really means to afflict. He's proved me. He's tested me. Proved is, uh, you know, testing you to see what's really there. And the Lord knows what's in my heart. 
it's been my purpose and my desire to keep his commandments. And uh, God has made me know what he taught Israel when they were in, the 40, in those 40 years in the wilderness. It's stated in verse 3. It says, He humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know that. He might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. And then the second thing I want you to notice is in verse 10. It says, When thou hast eaten and art full, thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. So I have eaten and am full, and God has richly blessed me far beyond anything I deserved. I know we're going to have a conference starts this Saturday, and I won't get to preach during the conference. And so today is my intention to do what God commanded Israel in this verse, and that is to bless the Lord my God for the good that he's given me. Uh, I want to give a testimony of praise to God. I shouldn't have picked those two songs earlier today. I, I can't sing three or one of them without crying. But I'm asking the Lord to use it to sanctify and edify his people. And I want the Lord to draw souls to himself. That's what I want for this conference, which is also the 65th anniversary of the church. I don't want to tell of my sins. I've heard testimonies sometimes that I thought they were bragging about how much they sinned. I'd like to take the opposite approach I do want to say what several verses in the Bible say, like Micah 7, 18, and I'm going to, these are all have plurals in them. I'm going to make them singular. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. That's what I've experienced. Or Psalm 103, verse 10. He hath not dealt with me after my sins, nor recorded, rewarded me according to my iniquities. Or Ezra 9, 13. After all that's come upon me for my evil deeds and for my great trespass, saying that thou, my God, has punished me less than my iniquities deserve, and has given me such deliverance as this. Or Lamentations 3. It is the Lord's mercies that I am not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. In verse 39, wherefore doth a living man complain, a man for the punishment of his sins? And then Ephesians 3, 8, unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. You know, there aren't any uh, famous well-known preachers are going to speak to us in this conference. As I've invited people that I know to be faithful and who have played a vital role in this church than the time that I've been here. And some are pastors and some are not, but they're all faithful to the Lord. And I want to say this, I could have asked some younger men who are faithful in our church to speak. I wouldn't I wouldn't hesitate. 
but I want to have people to give testimony to the Lord this Saturday. I hope you were planning to glorify the Lord with a testimony, and I'm trusting that uh, Lighthouse will have a part in that as well. But I don't want there to be any confusion about the purpose of these meetings, and I want all of you to desire the same things that I desire, and I want to ask you to pray to that end. But today I'm, today I'm going to take my turn, you know, so... For the 50 years that I've been saved and the 40 years that I've been pastor at Calvary Baptist Church, in spite of my innumerable sins and failures and unfaithfulness, God has blessed me above what I could ever have imagined because of his mercy and grace and he has kept every word of his book the Bible that's what I want you to know and I will talk I, obviously I couldn't say everything I would like to say but I want to talk about his mercy and grace in salvation, his mercy and grace in sanctification, and his mercy and grace in service. His mercy and grace in salvation, Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 1.15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I have chief. I really had a privilege of growing up in a a church-going family with two parents who uh, for all their lives were exposed to the Bible and they were exposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The parents took me to church. They taught me right from wrong. I don't believe there's ever a meal that we ate at our house that we didn't have prayer before the meal. Profanity was not allowed in our home. My parents had a good marriage. I didn't even know this till I was a pastor here, but my dad prayed that uh, one of his ch sons would be a pastor, a preacher. And because of these influences, I wasn't a rebellious child. I had a very happy childhood. But of course, like every, everybody else on the face of this earth, every single one of us, I was a sinner. And Romans 3.10, through 12 apply to me as it is written there is none righteous no not one there is none that understandeth there is none that seeketh after God they are all gone out of the way they are together become unprofitable there is none that doeth good no not one Job described me how much more abominable and filthy is man who drinketh iniquity like water you know, my parents loved me, they disciplined me, they protected me from many wicked influences. However, those things could not change the wickedness in my core being. Now, I didn't become a criminal in man's eyes, but I was a vile, as vile as any soul on this earth. And as I've become more knowledge about the holiness of God, I have to confess that I've broken every single one of the Ten Commandments. Adultery, adultery, lying, dishonoring parents, murder, stealing, blasphemy, I, I've committed every one of those sins. And God could have justly left me to my sins or taken my life while I was in darkness. I deserved none of the good that I've received of God. I should be in an eternal burning hell fueled by his righteous wrath. Revelation 21 verse 8 says, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burned with fire and brimstone. This is the second death. Actually, there's never been a time in my life when I um, 
wasn't in darkness. And yet, there had been a time in my life when I didn't know that the Son of God died for my sins and that he rose from the dead. Um, but that didn't stop me from sinning. That didn't cause me to uh, cry out to him in repentance. And I really, I fit right in with the condemned in Romans 1.20. It says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And I was without excuse. But God sent a newly saved college student to teach the Bible in my Sunday school class. And Matthew 4, 16 really describes what happened there for me. It says, The people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region in shadow of death, light is sprung up. That was when I was a sophomore in high school. He was a senior at the University of North Carolina that came home on Sunday to teach our Sunday school class. And as I've said many times, he's the first Sunday school teacher that I remember using the Bible. And the Bible opened my eyes to the fact that I was lost and that I was headed to hell. And from John 3, he explained what Jesus said in verse 3. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And when he taught it, I believed it. I enjoyed it. He gave us Bible reading. I did it. But chapter 3, John 3, verse 19 is what described my response. And this is the condemnation that light has come in the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And so after I understood that I was lost for probably six months, I chose to stay in my sins and not be born again. And uh, as I've mentioned many times, I was afraid that if I gave my life to Christ and turned from my sin and took him as Lord, the same merciful, gracious God would make my life miserable. That's what I believed. And thankfully, as he was teaching through John, I got to verse 10 of chapter 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and destroy. But I have come that you might have life and might have it more abundantly. And so one day in March of 1973, actually I think it might have already been dark, so that evening, I got on my knees in my bedroom and called on the Lord to save me. And I was born again. In John 5, verse 24, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me, and hath, that's the present tense, hath everlasting life, and then the future, shall not come into condemnation, and then a perfect tense, is passed from death unto life. And that's what the Lord did for me on my bedroom, in my bedroom on Hanford Road. And 2 Corinthians 5, 17 was true. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things were passed away. Behold, all things became new. I had a real temper when I was a child. By the time I was in high school, even though it wasn't allowed in my house, profanity was a regular part of my speech. When I got saved, I had peace and a new purpose. My whole outlook on living changed immediately, dramatically. But sadly, I was not instructed to be baptized and didn't know what a true church was. And so that brings me to the Lord's mercy and grace and sanctification. In Acts 2, as we've memorized, verse 
40 to 42, it says, With many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were added in about 3,000 souls, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and prayers. So even though the New Testament gives clear pattern for those who are redeemed, this pattern was not communicated to me, and really for a few years, my growth was slow. Now, my Sunday school teacher taught me to read the Bible every day. And it says here in Deuteronomy 8, verse 1, All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. And uh, also verse 3, as I said there at the second half, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Romans ten seventeen says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And Jesus prayed in John seventeen seventeen, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. And those things begin to, take place from the Bible reading. But uh, my Sunday school teacher graduated from UNC. And so us teens were left to our own spiritual growth. Most of us were swept into the charismatic movement, at least for a number of years. And so heard a lot about tongues and healing and extra biblical prophecy and disregard for church but not really anything about really living for the Lord and while I was in high school I learned by asking him that our Presbyterian pastor was a lost man and so thank the Lord as I said I didn't really know what a true church was but I determined when I got to college I was going to get in a church that preached the gospel and I found one. It was a Southern Baptist church. Of course, when I was at school at Clemson, they're, they're not promoting godliness there. So I was, dorms, dorm life was wicked. And of course, I was around athletes all the time. They were, were not saints either. I did join several campus college campus ministries, Navigators, Camps Crusade. I was the leader of Fellowship Christian Athletes for two or three years. Uh, but I was still re reading and memorizing scripture, but it was really a time of spiritual struggle. Uh, I experienced, and still do experience it, particularly during that time in Romans 7, 7, 18. Paul says, For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me. I had that because I was saved. But how to perform that which is good I find not. Fortunately, in that Southern Baptist church, a Sunday school teacher was a godly man. He was also a professor. He was actually the, the head of the political science department at Clemson. It's kind of hard to believe in it. But he was a godly man, and he began, uh, I asked him to, and he, he, had, he would do discipleship programs one-on-one, -on -one, but that professor decided to leave the Southern Baptist Church because of the compromise in the Southern Baptist Convention, and he he knew what 2 Corinthians 6 taught about being not unequally yoked together with unbelievers and it, that it commands us to come out from among them and be ye separate. And I guess as an adult, he finally came to understand what that meant regarding the church that he was a member of. And so we, I followed him, we began tending a little church started in a bank building. It was an independent Baptist church. And again, I know I've mentioned this, but I, I believe the first time that I attended there that the pastor parked on 
how proud and arrogant athletes were. I don't know why he did that. I mean, I do, but but I kept going back. I was the 18th uh, member to join that church, and that was time when my growth started moving a little more rapidly from the preaching. I heard on preaching on things like music and how that affects us and modesty and movies, other things regarding to Christian holiness. And for the first time in my life, I heard preaching and sound doctrine. And I came to understand things like Titus 2, 11 to 15, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works, these things speak and exhort rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. I hadn't had any of that until I joined that church, but thank the Lord for his mercy to me. And so when I joined that church, it really became as my, basically my, my senior year. Uh, it became a time of life-changing decisions. Here in Deuteronomy 8 and verse 2, it says, And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And there were some pretty difficult decisions during those times. Of course, I was reading the New Testament as well, Luke 14 it says in verses 25 that there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, and there were a lot of people I knew that professed to be saved. But Jesus said, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me, cannot be my disciple. And then a little further down, so likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. And I read those things and I heard about them in church. And the more I sat under sound Bible preaching, the more I understood my carnality. And I began to consider more what the Bible said, like Psalm 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But, in his, but his light is in the law of the Lord, and in this law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf all shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Certainly read about Daniel and his decision in Daniel 1, verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat and with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. And there were a number of things that I had to consider and make choices about. I had to begin to evaluate the way that I had lived even since I had been a Christian. And uh, Proverbs 4 exhorted me. Enter not in the path of the wicked. Go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it, pass not by it, and turn from it, and pass away. Or 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. But if he which hath called you is holy, so be holy in all manner of conversation. For it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And so that seemed my senior year, I considered quitting football so I could give time to serve the Lord and I talked with my pastor about it and he had advised against it so I didn't 
But the Lord began to speak to my heart about a call to preach. And my pastor and the church agreed. And eventually I was ordained by University Baptist Church in Clemson. And so the Lord showed his mercy and grace in sanctifying me through the local church. And he has shown me his mercy and grace in service. My pastor at University Baptist was a fundamentalist. He advised that I get seminary training, so you know, I went to Bob Jones. Uh, got the Master of Divinity degree. Then after I became a pastor here, a doctor of ministry. When I was at uh, the church there at Clemson as a college student, served as a visitation pastor, and I worked with young people. Of course, I've got doctrinal training in our church and in school. And during a number of those years, it was my commitment to try to witness to at least one person every day, give them the gospel. I made for some long days sometime after, if you're living with Christians and you're going to a Christian school, <laughs> you're, you have to make a special effort to get out and witness. And thank the Lord, I began to pray even more when I, when I was still in high school, a, young, a man, a Christian friend, older man, gave me a book on the Christian family. And I began praying for a wife. I wanted somebody that loved the Lord and had godly training in their home and had strong convictions. So I was praying about that. I thought for sure the Lord would give me a wife before I finished school, you know, went out. But he tested me and proved me. <laughs> But as I finished the Master of Divinity degree and began to pray about what the Lord had had me to do, he directed me. I don't even know how. The Chapel Hill, I didn't, didn't have any visions or anything. But I came here with a purpose to plant or to start a church. And uh, the guy who was the head of the ministerial class came with me. And he said he thought he knew a pastor in this area. And he stopped right out here in Preacher Hart. He was mowing the yard. And um, I told him what I was wanting to do to come. And he said, well, he was planning to retire. And he asked me to consider taking this church. And so of August of 1983, I was 26 and single. I wasn't scripturally baptized really ignorant about much of what it means to be a pastor. But I did believe Joshua 1.8. In this book of the law shalt thou meditate day and night that thou may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. And then thou shalt have good success. And I believe that the Bible is given by inspiration of God, as it says in 2 Timothy 3, and it was profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And the next verse is after that, command the pastor to preach the word. And I believe that. I believe that was God's will. And so when I came to Calvary, they had just had a split. And a youth pastor had tried to take the church. I, this is all before I got here, but I was told that several young couples had left the church. And uh, so the church was kind of weakened. Certainly there was need for spiritual growth among the members in their commitment and their convictions. I just believe preaching the Bible, preaching expositional messages and going through Bible books. And if you don't know how to pastor, you just preach the Bible. And if you pray, that those, I believe those were the answers. And that's what they believed in Acts 6. We will give ourselves continued to prayer and to the ministry of the word. That's what I believed. 
but it's not just preaching and prayer as essential as those are, but there needs to be strong leadership for a church to honor God. And so even while I was single, in the first year or two of being a pastor, um, two key early challenges. A guy who was a son out of, he, he got saved in this church, he actually kind of worked in the church. But he went to Germany as a missionary. And so while I was pastoring here, he came home. And I didn't know, but he'd had a bunch of trouble everywhere else. Uh, but our church knew him. He's probably twice my age. And so he was a missionary our church supported. He was out of our church. We weren't an ascending church. But so I asked him to fill the pulpit while I was gone one Sunday. And so he took Sunday school class to condemn a bunch of things that we were doing. And so everybody else knew him. He grew up with all of them. He had been a policeman here in Carborough. And so when I heard that he had done that, one of the young people told me. I got together some of the men and to the great surprise, my great surprise, they, they agreed and voted him out. He told me he'd die before he'd apologize. He hadn't apologized. I'm not sure whether he's still alive or not. But the second thing was I decided to have a Valentine's banquet. And so all the ladies got together. And they had a big fight. I think that was like on a Monday night. So on Sunday, I preached from Philippians 4, verses 2 and 3. I beseech you, Odious, and beseech Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, with my other fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. And I preached a message called Headlines in Heaven. And we had one lady came forward that day to the altar. But I think it affected a lot more people in that church than that one lady. We had a change in missionary philosophy. I think we supported about 25 missionaries at that time. Several of them were radio stations, children's homes, schools, mission, mission boards. And uh, there wasn't very strong separation. So we changed the emphasis to evangelism and church planting and church sent missionaries. And uh, tried to give our missionaries about 10% of their monthly support. And the Lord blessed, has blessed Calvary financially. I don't, I don't really know how many other churches is this way, but for about every one dollar that goes to our church, it comes in. There's at least fifty cents that goes to missions from you folks. I think that's extremely rare, especially upon a church our size. And not only that, for but for such a small church, I'm very well paid. And you also pay Pastor Russ some. And I, I think I've said something about that recently, but I want to thank you. Thank you. Calvary was started as Calvary Missionary Baptist Church in August or September, somewhere in there, in 1958. And August the 29th, 1958, Kathy... And Mosier was born. Was born. I don't think I got that out quite. So my wife and the place of my calling came to existence almost the same day. Maybe the exact same day. I don't know. But next to my salvation, that's the greatest 
answer to any prayer that I've ever prayed. To meet and to marry Kathy Mosier. And she's been a great encouragement. Her prayer, her godliness, her consistent walk. She's been a wise mother to my children. I want to say, because I won't be saying anything about them in the conference, but I'm extremely grateful to the Lord for my children for their salvation, for their lives, for their service, for their spouses. And uh, they bring me great joy. Of course, I'm praying for the salvation of my grandchildren. But it is a special privilege from God to be, to have as a church to be able to send out two families to start Lighthouse. And the Lighthouse has been a great encouragement and a joy to me. And when Pastor Russ and I had to pastor Lighthouse for two and a half years, that was a big challenge, but it was also a wonderful blessing. I think probably Pastor Russ would say the same thing. And I think I really appreciate about Lighthouse is that they received the preaching. They were willing to receive the preaching. And certainly I appreciate the, the ministry of Pastor and Mrs. Byler. But I want you to know today I'm very grateful for the faithful people of Calvary, for your love for the Lord, for your faithful service, for your strong stands for the Lord. And the Lord kind of put a, this burden on my heart to pray for. Psalm 119, 79, several years ago. Let those that fear thee turn unto me, and those that have known thy testimonies. And that has been joyfully answered in our church. And I have to give special recognition to Joe and Linda Russ. They've been, they've been faithful, supportive, and sacrificial. I greatly appreciate them. So today, I want to end this message by reading Deuteronomy 8, verses 10 to 18 again. It says, When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command thee this day. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness where were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the flint rock of flint, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, and that it might prove thee to do thee good at thy latter end. And thou say in thine heart, My power and the might of mine hand hath got me this wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he sware unto thy fathers as it is this day. And the Lord has given me great and eternal riches, all because of his mercy to my sins and his grace toward my efforts to serve it. And so I want you to remember these three passages from today. Lamentations 3. 
How's a start? <laughs> Let me get my verses out. It is of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. That passage, and then John 10:10. 10, 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and destroy. You can just count on every other influence in the world as being part of the thief. But Jesus said, But I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And then one verse that I haven't used yet, but it's um, sort of a life verse for me, Romans 1, 16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God into salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. So again, I just wanted to uh, today to do... What it says in verse 10, Then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good which he hath given thee. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your mercy to me. I thank you for the daily benefits that you've loaded and in my life. I thank you for your grace toward my ignorance and disobedience. I'm thankful for the good people you sent to Calvary. Thank you for the privilege of being able to serve you. And Lord, I pray that all of these here and others would have the same experience your blessing that I have enjoyed. And I pray that there's anyone here who's unsaved or anyone who hears this on the internet, I pray that you would bless your word in bringing repentance and salvation. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.